就是哎，他这边就是，就是这样，我们。So now we've come to verse number fourteen. So again, I'll read each line in Pali, and then you recite. Yas anusaya, nasanusaya, nasanti kechi, nasanti kechi. Mulacha akusala, Mulacha akusala, Samuhatase, Samuhatase, So biku jahati, So biku jahati, Ora param, Ora param, Ora go jinamiva, Ora go jinamiva, Tacham purana. Okay, and then the translation. One who has no latent tendencies at all, whose unwholesome roots have been uprooted, that monk gives up the here and the beyond. As a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Okay, and here there are two key terms. In line one, the key term is anusaya. The Where it says yas anusaya, that's just a conjunction uh, due to a conjunction of vowels, but it would be broken down. Yasa anusaya, one for whom there are no anusaya, and so the word anusaya. Comes from the prefix anu, which means, amongst other things, along with, and then the stem of the word is saya, which comes from the verb seti, which means or sayati, which means to lie down. So anusias are things which lie along with, that is, which lie along with a person. As in a kind of latent form, you know, the Chinese use the translation for that sway mian. So sway is along with, and mian is sleeping. So that which sleeps along with. So that is in line, the first line. Then the key word or expression that comes in line two. And we've already encountered these in earlier verses. This is the akusala mula. So mula is root, and then these are akusala mula, the unwholesome roots. So in Buddhism, we have three unwholesome roots and three wholesome roots. Now I'll come to the three roots. A little later. First, we take the latent tendencies, and so the discourses often enumerate seven latent tendencies. So 
So these are called the latent tendencies to sensual lust, to aversion or ill will, to views, to doubt, to conceit, then to bhavaraga, which I translate lust for existence, even though this can be like a very subtle desire to the word lust. But I want to be consistent in using lust for sensual lust, kamaraga, or lust seems to work well. But bhavaraga is a kind of subtle desire or clinging to conditioned existence. But of course the Pali uses the word raga to be consistent, I also use lust. And then the latent tendency to ignorance. I sometimes find it curious why are certain factors or defilements singled out as latent tendencies, others are singled out as nivarana hindrances, others are singled out as samyojana fetters. Interesting question. I don't think I've ever seen that discussed. But anyway, we have these seven latent tendencies and then the Noble Eightfold Path is to be developed for direct knowledge of these seven latent tendencies, for full understanding of them, for their destruction, for their abandonment. And of these seven latent tendencies, sometimes three are mentioned, sort of singled out and put taken as the primary latent tendencies. And here it specifies just lust without distinguishing whether it's sensual lust or lust for existence, but probably here it's mostly sensual lust. The other is aversion. So we give some special highlighting to these. aversion, and then the third is ignorance. And the reason why these three are singled out and given special attention is because these are said to arise in as reactions to or responses to the three primary types of feeling. Okay, so we have pleasant feelings, And so normally, when one is touched or contacted by a pleasant feeling, then the normal tendency is to delight in it, to welcome it, and to cling to it. And so that delight that arises in relation to pleasant feeling, that is what ignites, or that is what expresses the latent, or brings to manifestation the latent tendency to lust. So this is like desire or clinging, because the natural tendency of the mind is to cling to pleasant feelings and to the objects that give pleasant feelings. Okay, so when pleasant feeling arises, then we become attached to that object that's giving us pleasant feeling, and we don't want to be separated from it. Okay, then when a painful feeling arises, then the natural response is to reject that painful feeling, to try to get free from it, to either destroy the cause of the painful feeling or to escape from it in some kind of distraction or diversion. And so this response to the painful feeling this is a manifestation of the latent tendency to aversion. And if that latent tendency to aversion, if it manifests strongly enough, then as the painful feeling arises, then one will, will be overcome by sorrow, by grief, even weeping and wailing. And then one might, in the extreme case, beat one's breast and becomes distraught. Oh me, oh my, why happened to me? Oh, I'm so miserable.
Beautiful. Okay, so all of that is expressing or bringing to manifestation the latent tendency to aversion. Okay, then when there's neither a distinctly pleasant feeling or a distinctly painful feeling, then there's this neutral feeling, which is called the neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And in that case, if one does not understand its origin, that is, its arising, its passing away, the gratification or enjoyment that comes from the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, because even the neither painful nor pleasant feeling can be a kind of peaceful and quiet and dull, peaceful feeling. And so one could take, find enjoyment in that dull, neutral feeling. Then there's the danger in it. The danger is that it's impermanent. So if one seeks enjoyment in it, when it passes away, then there comes disappointment. And then the escape from that feeling. So if one doesn't understand that, then this indicates the presence of the latent tendency to ignorance. So the latent tendency to ignorance is actually, I would say, present in regard to all three feelings. But in the case of pleasant feeling, the tendency to lust is dominant, and the tendency to ignorance is sort of just quiet in the background. In the case of painful feeling, the latent tendency to aversion is dominant, but the latent tendency of ignorance is present in the background. But when there's neither of those more prominent feelings, then the neutral feeling is present. And so there's neither the lust nor the aversion. And so now the latent tendency to ignorance is sort of operating on its own through this failure to understand the origin, disappearance, and so forth. And so this past, this part of the sutta is explaining the positive side. So this is the case where when one is touched by a pleasant feeling, then one does not delight in it, welcome it, and cling to it. So in that case, we would say the latent tendency to lust is not operative. When one is touched by a painful feeling, then if one doesn't, get overwhelmed by sorrow and so forth, does not weep, does not experience resentment to that painful feeling, then the latent tendency to aversion is now not operative. And then when one is touched by a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, if one understands the ori its origin, disappearance, gratification, danger and escape, then the latent tendency to ignorance is not operative. It's being eclipsed by knowledge. And then the, the text goes on to say, by abandoning the latent tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, by abolishing the latent tendency to aversion towards painful feeling, by uprooting the latent tendency to ignorance in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling, you can make an end to dukkha. Then I just took a short sutta where the Buddha says, I will teach you the way to uprooting the latent tendencies. So when you know and see the I as non-self, the latent tendencies are uprooted. When you know and see forms, um, eye consciousness, eye contact, the feeling that arises based on eye contact, when you see all this as non-self, then the latent tendencies are uprooted. Okay, this just says, in effect, the same thing that was said by an earlier passage. Okay, so now we come to the 
three unwholesome roots. So here the Buddha is speaking to the monks and he says, if they ask you, that is if others should ask you, what is the cause and reason for the non-arising of unarisen lust and for the abandoning of arisen lust, you should reply the unattractive meditation object. For one who attends properly to the unattractive meditation object, unarisen lust will not arise and arisen lust will be abandoned. So what is the unattractive meditation object? That's exactly what we did yesterday. That's the meditation on the 32 parts of the body. That's actually one of the unattractive meditation objects. <laughs> but sometimes the texts also mention as the unattractive meditation objects. <laughs> no, we're not all that morbid. <laughs> but it's <laughs> the meditation on corpses <laughs> in different stages of, disintegr of decay and disintegration. And so that is what's used in the Visuddhi Magga under the Asubha, the unattractive meditation subject. It mentions ten stages in the decomposition of a, of a corpse. Many, many years ago, in 1985, it was 1985, when I was living in Sri Lanka, there was a monk, I think he was American, and he just was newly ordained, fairly newly ordained, and he went off to a cave, and somehow he managed, in a rather remote and place, difficult of access, and somehow he, ma <laughs> he managed to get <laughs> a decaying corpse <laughs> brought to that cave. And so the word of this came out, and somebody then eventually came to me and said that they were afraid that that monk might go become mentally unhinged. And they asked me to go to speak to him. <laughs> so I had to travel some distance and climb up this rocky mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like hanging on to the precipice, like a precipice to get up to his cave. Oh, and he made a vow of silence also. <laughs> and he had a determination that he will not, would not leave the cave unless, until he becomes an arahant. <laughs> and I remember that when I got to the village near that mountain, and then I asked, the, I said, told the villagers that I had to speak to that monk. And I think somebody asked, what about? And I said that we think that that monk is doing something a little dangerous, that he might get mentally unhinged. But they had heard that he had made that vow that he won't come down until he becomes an arha. And so they were trying to discourage him. <laughs> they thought, we want to have him come down <laughs> as an arha so we can make offerings to him. <laughs> and so I tried to reason with him, but he wrote, my determination is not to come down till I become an Arha. Then I, after some point I never heard what happened to him. <laughs> Did you see the corpse? Did you see no, because I didn't... I think the way it worked, I don't think I saw the corpse, if I remember. I think my memory is a little vague, but I think I had to get somebody to go. Yeah, like his cave was like a long way off along that precipice. So I had to get a younger person.
from the village, who was more agile than myself, <laughs> to go along the edge of the precipice and tell him that there's a, another foreign monk who's come to visit him. And then he came out along the precipice to the place where I was, and then we spoke there. Okay, anyway, that's the unattractive meditation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what, friend, is the cause and reason for the non-arising of unarisen hatred and for the abandoning of arisen hatred? And so you should reply, the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness. For one who attends properly to the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness, unarisen hatred will not arise and arisen hatred will be abandoned. Now with regard to these two, I, these two passages have to be, in a sense, um, interpreted like they shouldn't be taken literally or definitively because the unattractive meditation object that is the, thir the 32 parts of the body is not the way to ultimately eradicate lust and the liberation of the mind by loving kindness is not the way to ultimately eradicate hatred what the meditation on the unattractive does is to because it is a concentration meditation subject. So what it does is through the perception of the unattractive nature of the body, it helps to suppress the sensual lust. But the tendency, the latent tendency is still there. And similarly with hatred, the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, which is the attainment of jhana through loving kindness, will suppress or suspend ill will and hatred, but won't eradicate it. What is necessary to eradicate lust and hatred is the cultivation of wisdom or insight. That is what is needed to cut off the latent tendencies, the underlying tendencies. Okay, then the third root, this is delusion, so what is the cause and reason for the non-arising of unarisen delusion and for abandoning arisen delusion? And so the reply is, here it's given is proper attention. The Pali expression is yoniso or manasikara. So yoniso, the way I understand it, applies, but has the meaning of thoroughly, like from the origins on to the manifestation, one reflects or attends to something, considers it from various angles, examines closely and carefully in diverse aspects. So it's this proper, careful, thorough attention. So for one who attends properly, carefully, thoroughly to things, unarisen delusion will not arise and a risen delusion will be abandoned. Okay, so this takes care of verse 14 on the latent tendencies and the unwholesome roots. And if anybody, there are a lot of texts on the unwholesome roots that I might have collected. Um, but I just had to be selective. But if you look, particularly in the numerical discourses, the Anguttara and Nikaya, if you have a copy of that and then you look in the index, there should be uh, references to all of the passages on the unwholesome and wholesome roots. Well, I didn't mention the wholesome roots because they don't are not mentioned in the sutta, but the three wholesome roots are usually stated in the text as non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion. But this is the typical Indian way of using negations, but they can be seen as representing positive qualities. So for non-greed, we could say generosity and renunciation. For non-hatred, more positively expressed, loving-kindness and compassion. 
And then for non-delusion, more positively, wisdom or insight. Okay, the next two verses I've taken together because they're very similar. And so we'll recite both of them. Okay, number 15. Yasa Dharataja Yasa Dharataja Nasanti Kechi Nasanti Kechi Oram Agamanaya Oram Agamanaya Pachai Pachai Pacha Pachi Pachayase Pachayase so bhikkhu jahati, so bhikkhu jahati, o raparam, o raparam, urago jinamiva, urago jinamiva, tacham puranam, tacham puranam. Okay, then we, we'll go now directly to verse 16. Yasa vanataja. Yasa Vanataja Nasanti Kechi Nasanti Kechi Vini Banda Vini Bandaya Bavaya Vini Bandaya Bavaya Hetu Kapa Hetu Kapa So Biku Jahati So Biku Jahati Oraparam Oraparam Urago Jinamiva Tacham Puranam. Tacham Puranam. Okay, so verse 15 says, One who has no states, born from distress, as a condition for returning, here it says, to the near shore. That monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Then verse 16 says, One who has no states, born from desire, which are causes for bondage to existence, that monk gives up the here and the beyond, as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Okay, now in verse 15, the key word that occurs in the first line is Dharata Ja. And here the commentary, this is the commentary that gives an explanation. First maybe I should say something about the word Dharata. I looked this up in the dictionary and it seems to be a sort of Pali call it a corruption or poly transposition of a Sanskrit word the Sanskrit sort of root word or stem word would be jara which has the sense of burning so dara are things that burn and darata is an extension of that so things that burn that burn psychologically so that's why just seeking an English word, I use distress. And then here we have dharata with the suffix ja. And ja is from, well, the noun would be jati, birth. So ja is a suffix indicating born from. So these are and it's in the plural, so what's implied are states that are born from distress. And so the commentary says, here the defilements that have first arisen are called dharata. Yeah, it captures that meaning, that in the sense of burning or being feverish. Okay, then when they are, are, have arisen again and again, 
because they have been born of the initial Dharata, then they are named Dharata Ja. You know, it's a little like contrived explanation. Otherwise, I don't know what to make out of the Dharata Ja. Maybe you could see that uh, maybe many other psychological states arise out of this distress, the distress caused by the defilements. Maybe worry, anxiety, um, concern, and so forth. And then what's interesting, in the second line, we have the expression Orang Agamanaya. So Agamana is coming or coming back to, and Orang is what is near. So in the refrain, I have Oraparong as the here contrasted with the beyond. So Orang is what is near, and it could even be taken as the near shore in the sense of the lower realms of existence as opposed to the higher realms. So, if we take that interpretation, then the states born of this burning, of this distress, when they are eliminated, it doesn't mean that one is utterly liberated from samsara, but one then becomes an anagami, non-returner, not coming back to the sense sphere or the sense, sensuous realm of existence, the desire realm, but one is reborn as a non-returner in the form realm. This is the way my teacher, Venerable Nanaponika, interprets it. He wrote an essay on it, which I'll make available later, called The Worn Out Skin, and he interprets it in that way that verse 15 is stating the process by which one eliminates the distressful defilements, those which are connected with ill will and diversion, and thereby, one be, maybe with sensual desire and aversion, and thereby one becomes a non-returner on the third stage of realization. And then he explains verse 16, that is, the one who has no states born from desire, then he sees that the contrast here is vini bandhaya bhavaya, that those states born of desire are what bind one to existence in its entirety. So that is indicating the cutting off of craving by which one is liberated entirely from the cycle of birth and death becoming an arahat. Yeah, so here the commentary explains vanatajā, born from desire, it says it should be understood analogously to dharatajā, but there is this difference so he's, it says, vana is a synonym for craving, vanata is a designation for the latent tendency to craving, then vanata ja are the states that are born of vanata, the states born from the latent tendency to craving. So these will be all of the states that emerge out from desire, desire in the form of craving. Yeah, I took this passage, I think it's an excellent passage, from the worn out skin. This is from Venerable Nyanaponika. So he writes, he uses the word actually, <laughs> somebody yesterday asked about anxiety. He uses the word anxiety for dharata, whereas I use distress. And then he used attachment for vanata, where I use desire. So he, he writes that anxiety and attachment can be interpreted here as dormant tendencies, as basic moods causing appropriate manifestation, 
Anxiety appears as anguish, fear and worry, and as feelings of tension, oppression and depression caused by those emotions. All these moods and feelings create a negative emotional background in the character, which may color one's human relationships and influence decisions of consequence. It, it may also throw a deep shadow over one's attitude to life in general and may lead to a shirking of reality, to a recoil from it. When anguish and worry continue to grow in the mind, without finding relief, they may become the cause of the anxiety neuroses, which is so re widespread in times of emotional and social insecurity. And he was writing this in Sri Lanka, maybe, I don't know, 1950s, 1960s, <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> with our <laughs> present administration. <laughs> times of emotional, seriously, it's times of emotional and social insecurity have become not only widespread, but greatly, greatly in increase, intensified. Okay, then as to attachment, he says, via states born of attachment, this leads to entanglements in the thicket, that's another meaning of the word vanita, the thicket or jungle of life. So these entanglements through attachment are of many kinds and they throw over humankind the widespread catch net of craving. And this refers to a verse in Sutta Nipata 527. Apart from those that are openly seductive, others appear in an innocuous or respectable guise or are rationalized in more or less convincing ways. And then he says, anxiety and attachment, these two well up from an unfathomable past and again and again become, as the text says, conditions for renewed existence here and beyond. But even though Venerable Nyanabunika came from Germany and learned English relatively late in his life, but he was really an outstanding stylist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, maybe should we take the questions, some questions now? Okay, we can take questions now. <laughs> <laughs> the last, let me just see what's, oh, I think we, yeah, we should okay. take questions now because I see it goes on for page 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should let Bonte oh. first. He seems to be. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a couple of poly questions. Uh, first off, um, so vana, I've seen before vana translated as craving, um, but it's more common usage is to mean a uh, grove or a, a group of, a uh, cup of forest. Yeah. So, is there any correlation between those two meanings? Mm. Because they seem to be quite different meanings. I think one would. I would have to look in the dictionary. Okay. Yeah. My other question is K2 Kappa in yeah. verse 16, yeah. which you have translated as causes. Yeah. K2 by itself means cause. So, what yeah. is Kappa doing in that compound? What yeah, does that mean? Kappa sometimes has a sense of functioning as or being similar to. Um, <laughs> here I'm not quite sure, I have to confess. Okay. But it seems like there's no real significant difference between Hetu and Hetu Kappa. Okay. Yeah. It could just be filling out the meter. explain something? And Excuse me? Could you explain something? I have a question about in the um, quote you had from your teacher above that was about anxiety. Yeah, and yeah. Can you go up? I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but... It, oh, a little bit down. Okay. 
These entanglements through attachment of many kinds endure over humankind, the widespread catching of craving. Apart from those that are openly seductive, others appear in innocuous or respectful or guise. Yeah, and I was curious about that last one. Apart from those that are openly seductive, and others appear in innocuous or respectful guise or are rationalized in more or less convincing ways. Is that referring to the fact that anxiety or attachment is like self-rationalizing in some way? Like, because my experience of anxiety sometimes is that there's a sense of like being anxious is going to be useful. Being and then anxious. Being anxious is going to be useful for some yeah. reason. Like yeah. that, like it's a self-perpetuating state because the yeah. feeling of anxiety is like if you worry about this, then like maybe that'll ha you'll have some control over your reality. Like that's my experience sometimes yeah. is that yeah. it's a self-perpetuating. Yeah. Kind yeah. of convince, like it's self-convincing. Yeah. Or yeah. So here it seems that he's writing about it, the states born of attachment rather than anxiety. Okay. But one could also see the way you put it very nicely that anxiety, one also can try to rationalize the anxiety in order to to smooth it over and to allow it to continue to, to operate. And so, in that case, one would have to, you know, maybe, because anxiety is always accompanied by a feeling of distress mm -hmm. and you know, disturbance. And so, it would be naturally a state that one wants to be free from. And so the rationalization of it we have to sort of cut through that rationalization of it and realize that one would be psychologically better off without the anxiety, but at the same time, it's good to be <coughs> heedful, you know, instead of not being anxious, but to be heedful and alert about things that portend real trouble or danger. Right. I think right. that's the, the difficulty is that, like, just anxiety, which isn't actually coming from anywhere kind of rational place or like yeah. it's like a misperception of danger where there is none yeah like yeah, in yeah. a very extreme yeah very or intense. maybe it's a feeling that there's something threatening or dangerous but one is not able to specify an actual object yes exactly I think there was a, <laughs> who was it was it freud i don't know somebody said that the difference between fear and anxiety is that fear has a, a specific object, something that one can pinpoint as the cause of the fear, whereas anxiety, maybe the way he used it, is just a kind of free-floating like mood. mood of apprehension. Or and it's very physical, too. It's like and very physical. Oh, yeah, physical. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just wanted to know, I guess you answered my question, just yeah. clarifying yeah. what that yeah. line was about. Okay, first Lynn, and then David. So I have a grammar question, um, going back to the first passage that you discussed. The first, the first verse? Yeah. yeah. So um, if you could scroll back, I okay. don't remember exactly, but I guess I'm just wondering why, instead of just simply using the word lust, why the double negative is used in all this? Yeah, I guess it's there. Like, a I think because this is making a contrast, like this is often the way the Buddha speaks about dealing with the defilements. Okay. So there's a contrast being established here that unarisen lust, okay, so that it will not arise, and then this is contrasted with the arisen lust will be abandoned. I understand that, but why, why are unarisen and arisen even used when it could just read, lust will not arise, 
and less will be abandoned. I think it becomes, to my mind, it becomes clearer to say unarisen. So, okay, I'm in a kind of tranquil, um, peaceful mood. The mind is quite calm, inwardly drawn, balanced, well-focused. So, in that case, during that time there's no arisen lust. Lust hasn't arisen. But then, if I'm not careful, then the lust can arise. And then there will be like other occasions where lust has a... So, to as a kind of insurance that unarisen lust will not arise, then from time to time I would practice the unattractive meditation object to sort of impress on the mind the perception of the unattractive nature of the body and then that will prevent, say, when there's an encounter with an attractive object, will prevent the lust from arising. You mean the unarisen lust? From yeah, that's the, it will yeah. prevent the unarisen lust from arising. On other occasions, the lust has arisen, and so I want to find an antidote to it to prevent it from persisting and getting stronger. So then, I would take up the unattractive meditation I mean, I understand that, but I just I don't understand why you use unarisen lust versus lust. Yeah, that is the reason. Is it latent? Excuse me? Is it latent? I mean, I always... Of course that. it's there latently. It's Otherwise, there. if it weren't there latent, latently, it wouldn't arise at all. Right. So, I mean, that's how I always understood okay. unarisen, because it's not... It, it is there, but it's not yeah. there. It's not, a, it's not it's, apparent. It's there it's in a latent form. It's not yet manifest, not yet operating, not active in the mind. <coughs> you want to talk about Monday something? You want to talk about Monday something? You want to talk about Monday What was that? I'm just giving a silly example. Oh, oh. I guess the English teacher in me is... You know, I, I mean, I say it is quite reasonable because there's a difference. In fact, actually, this key ties into the way the Buddha elaborates on right effort or the four right efforts. So the first effort is to prevent the arising of unarisen, unwholesome mental states. So there's that's the effort to prevent. So. Unwho certain unwholesome states have not arisen, and then one has to use certain methods or techniques to prevent them from arising. And then the second right effort is the effort to eliminate arisen, unwholesome mental states. So it's the distinction between prevention and intervention, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good, good way to put it. Okay, David? Question. Um, we're talking about the seven weight yeah. That, that even a baby has them. Excuse me? That if, even a baby, if they have them. Oh, yeah, even if a baby has yeah. them, yeah. And, and I was wondering, aversion and ignorance, can I consider meta and wisdom as a latent tendency as well in, in the Pali Sutras? Meta and wisdom. Could they, could they be considered? Because I have to develop wisdom yeah. as if wisdom were, were not there. Yeah. So, is there the opposite of this bad related tendencies? Do we have, in the Pali we have something? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because the Anusayas are always considered like the latent tendencies to the defilements. Yeah. And those are said to be like persistent or, or in some, at some form existing in all sentient beings. And even, you mentioned the baby? Yes. Yeah, there's actually, interestingly, there's a sutta, um, it's Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 64, where the Buddha gives an example. He says that it, even though a baby doesn't have the idea of Sakaya, Sakaya is individual identity, but the latent tendency to Sakaya Ditti, the view of a self in regard to the person, 
lies latent within that baby. And even though the baby doesn't have the idea of any idea about Dharma teachings, <laughs> but the latent tendency to doubt about teaching <laughs> lies latent in that baby. And even though the baby doesn't have, I think it's, if I remember, it's the Sila Bhatta, even have the idea of Sila Bhatta, we could say, rules and observances. You know, these are the kinds of rules and observances followed by the Brahmins and the ascetics. But the tendency, the, late, the tendency to clinging to rules and observances lies latent in that baby. <laughs> okay, I would just say, this is as personal opinion, that we all have the capacity <laughs> the capacity for all of the virtuous qualities, like loving-kindness, compassion, wisdom, generosity. Yep. Maybe by virtue of our humanity, we have the disposition to those qualities. So we could call those latent tendencies, that which, 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 which with the appropriate procedures can be developed and manifested and expressed and brought to fulfillment. But as a technical term, the texts always use the word anusia in relation to <laughs> defilements, not in relation to the wholesome qualities. Maybe. Just thinking there's another related word, asaya. I'm just wondering whether that is ever used in relation to the good qualities. That would be something I would have to investigate. So, any, any other questions? Okay, so then we come to the next verse, the verse number 17. Yo, <coughs> yo ni varane pahaya pancha. Yo ni varane Pahaya Pancha Anigo Anigo Tina Katankato Tina Katankato Visalo Visalo So Biku Jahati Oropara So Biku Jahati Oropara Urago Jinamiva Urago Jinamiva Tacham Puranam. Puranam. So the translation reads, having abandoned the five hindrances, untroubled, crossed over perplexity, free of darts, that monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. <clears throat> okay, so the operative term, the key term in the verse, occurs in the first line. It's the pancha nivarana, which are the five hindrances. And then the second line can be seen in a way, maybe as an elaboration on the abandoning of the five hindrances. So it's said that the monk is unego. This is without, there's a word, ega, which is, occurs very rarely, which if I remember it's explained or enumerated in some suttas as lust, 
hatred and delusion. So unego is without the trouble, those three sources of trouble, lust, hatred and delusion. Then tina katankato. Okay, the word tina means crossed over. It's from the verb tarati, which means to cross. So this is the past participle. Okay, then, this word katankato is based on an interrogative word, the word that is posing a question, kata, which means how, you know, how is this, how is that? And so here it's to form this noun, it's duplicated. And so it's like somebody who's always asking, how is, how is this? How is that? How is this? How is that? Somebody whose mind is unsettled because they're plagued by doubts and questions. So that is somebody who's katankato, sort of overcome by perplexity. And one who is free of perplexity is one who is tina, crossed over perplexity. In fact, in the simile for the five hindrances, the hindrance of doubt is illustrated by somebody who is crossing a desert. And then when he gets to the other side of the desert, doubt is like a desert. And then when one crosses over the desert, then one is safe and secure. So crossing over somehow is used as the antidote or determination of doubt. And then visalo has the V is the negation, and sala is a dart or an arrow or a thorn. So when we are stricken by the defilements, it's like we are hit by darts. We have the dart within. Particularly, there's a sut some suttas where the Buddha speaks about some places an enumeration, I think, of five kinds of darts. Maybe it would be greed. Perhaps I have them someplace. Here it says five darts, the dart of lust, hatred, delusion, conceit, and views. But I remember also some places would speak about sorrow as a dart. So there is a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, removing the dart of sorrow. So there are many texts on the five hindrances. Okay, so I just took a selection of texts on the five hindrances. In fact, I should remind you that 
Looks like they disappeared. Oh, books are in the kitchen. Oh, they're in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I brought from the Zhuangyan Monastery some stacks of booklets, and one of the booklets is called The Five Mental Hindrances and Their Conquest. So that gives a collection of many texts on the five hindrances and those uh, texts that deal with the methods of removing them. Okay, so here is simply an enumeration of the five hindrances. So what are the five hindrances? The hindrance of sensual desire, ill will, and what's here translated sloth and torpor, which are actually said to be two distinct but related states. So I take tina, which is translated sloth, to be mental dullness, when the mind becomes sort of dull, rigid, <coughs> unmalleable, and torpor to be the drowsiness that descends on the mind. So usually what happens, at least the way I, <laughs> I experience it, first, maybe the mind is sort of bright, calm, well concentrated, and then a kind of, if one is not attentive, a kind of dullness slips into the mind, and the mind just becomes heavy and dull. And then because one is not able to revive that clear awareness, then as the dullness persists, the mind becomes heavier, and then set, slips into the state of drowsiness where one starts to nod off, to conk out. And this drowsiness, this is not the natural sleepiness that will come as one approaches one's bedtime, but it's like after you've had a good night's sleep, maybe the middle of the day, and normally you would be awake and active, but because you're sitting to meditate, then somehow as a kind of obstacle, this dullness and drowsiness slip into the mind. And because they, so they're considered two distinct states, but because they have the common quality of causing a mental inertia, so they're joined together as one hindrance. Okay, then the next hindrance is restlessness and remorse. In Pali, it's udacha and kukucha. So restlessness is agitation or unsettledness of mind. And then kukucha, it's the state of mind where one has done something wrong or maybe failed to do something that one should have done and because of that either co commission or omission, then omission or commission, or commission, one has omitted something or committed some wrong, then a sense of regret comes into the mind and starts gnawing away at the mind. And so instead of finding some way to sort of relieve oneself of that remorse. One keeps on reproaching oneself and criticizing oneself and blaming oneself. And then it becomes an obstacle to one's practice. And so restlessness and remorse, again, they're two distinct functions or states of mind, but they both have the common quality common nature of being some kind of unsettledness of the mind. Sometimes these, this hindrance is translated as restlessness and worry, but worry, the way I understand it, I think the way most people understand it, refers to the future. One worries, what am I going to do tomorrow? What's going to happen to me? when I'm in that situation, when I have to give a, a lecture in that big auditorium with a thousand people present. <laughs> what, am, what am I going to do when 
when I meet this person or that person. So that is worry referring to the future. So it seems to me that what we call worry really belongs together with restlessness. And remorse, kukucha, is referring to the past. Okay, then comes the hindrance of doubt. And the five hindrances, generally in the sequential development of the path, um, come before the attainment of the jhanas. So it seems to me that in this case, doubt is not referring to doubt about the doctrinal principles of the Buddha's teaching. You know, like doubt about dependent origination, or about the Four Noble Truths, or the teaching of non-self, and so forth. Because those are doubts that concern the wisdom, the training in wisdom. And the five hindrances normally come in the preliminary phase of the training in samadhi. So it seems to me that this is doubt about the practices to be undertaken for the development of samadhi. Of course, if one should be developing concentration, but one is still pondering the doctrinal principles of the Buddha's teaching and then gets troubled by doubts about them, then that doubt will also be a hindrance. Okay, so those are the five hindrances. Then the Noble Eightfold Path is to be developed, again, for the abandoning of these five hindrances. <clears throat> and what <clears throat> one way to deal with the five hindrances, to overcome them, is to reflect on the danger or pitfalls in these five hindrances. And here we have the statement that the five hindrances are makers of blindness, causing lack of vision, lack of knowledge. <coughs> They're detrimental to wisdom. They tend to vexation or mental distress, and they lead away from Nibbana. <coughs> And so that this is then, that introductory statement is then applied to each of the five hindrances individually. So if your mind sort of inclines to one or another of these five hindrances, then by examining the hindrance in terms of this particular matrix, that will stir up the intention and the motivation to eliminate or to overcome that hindrance. And then what I found, and this is somewhat interesting, <coughs> there are a number of suttas which place the five hindrances and the four foundations of mindfulness in a relationship of opposition, as if the development of the four foundations of, of mindfulness is the antidote to the five hindrances. So here this sutta says, if one were to say of anything that it is a heap of the unwholesome, it is about the five hindrances that one could say this. For this is a complete heap of the unwholesome, namely the five hindrances. And then if one were to say of anything, it's a heap of the wholesome, it is about the four establishments of mindfulness, that one could rightly say this. For this is a complete heap of the wholesome, that is, the four establishments of mindfulness. And then I just came to mind another sutta, in which it is said that all those who have been liberated from the world have been liberated by abandoning 
the five hindrances, which are obstacles of the mind, by establishing themselves in the four foundations of mindfulness and by correctly developing the seven factors of enlightenment. So we could see both the four foundations of mindfulness and the seven factors of enlightenment to be the antidotes to the five hindrances, to permanently eliminating them. And in fact, in the <coughs> sutta on the four foundations of mindfulness, in mindfulness of dhammas, we have first comes the section on the five hindrances, how to deal with the five hindrances, and then later in that section comes the development of the seven factors of enlightenment. So, the sutta on the foundations of mindfulness is putting at the negative, on the negative side, the five hindrances, and then on the positive side, the seven factors of enlightenment. Okay, then this is the standard passage on abandoning the five hindrances. And then this passage has the similes that go with each of the hindrances. Okay, so it's speaking about a monk who's returned to his residence after his alms round, and then he's taken his meal, then he sits down, crosses his legs, sets his body upright, establishes mindfulness before him. Then it says, abandoning covetousness for the world this, in a way, is expression is doing service for the hindrance of sensual desire. So, he abandons covetousness for the world, abides with a mind free from covetousness, and he purifies his mind from covetousness. So that's the first hindrance. Then the second, abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies the mind from ill will and hatred, abandoning sloth and torpor. He abides free from sloth and torpor, perceiving light, mindful and fully aware. He purifies his mind from sloth and torpor, abandoning restlessness and remorse. He abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. Thus he purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt. Again, this is or having. Here I have crossed over, but it's the same expression. Tina vi, here is Tina vi chikicho. So, gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome States. So he purifies his mind from doubt. Then some similes are used to illustrate this. So to illustrate the freedom from the hindrance of sensual desire, and the very concrete, very um, vivid similes. Suppose a man were to take a loan and to start a business and his business is successful so that he could repay all of his old debts and there would be <laughs> remain enough extra to maintain a wife. <laughs> and considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. So that is taken to illustrate the overcoming sort of temp tentative overcoming of sensual desire. Okay, then next is the overcoming of ill will or hatred. And so here we have the case of a suppose a man were afflicted, suffering and gravely ill, and his food would not agree with him, and his body had no strength, but later he would recover from the affliction and his food would, would agree with him, and his body would regain its strength. Then on considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. So this is the 
simile representing freedom from ill will and hate, which is probably like an illness afflicting the mind. Okay, then the third, to illustrate the third hindrance, suppose a man were in prison, but later he would be released from prison safe and secure, with no loss to his property, then on considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. So this, I guess the prison would be sloth and torpor, and dullness and drowsiness. So now, when those are eliminated, it's like being released from prison. Okay, then the fourth simile, suppose a man were a slave, not self-dependent, but sort of subordinate to others, unable to go where he wants, but later he would be released from slavery, he becomes self-dependent, independent of others, a freed man, able to go where he wants, then on considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. So this is illustrating freedom from restlessness and remorse. Okay, and then the, the fifth hindrance, suppose a man with wealth and property had entered a road going across a desert, but then later on he's crossed over the desert and now he's safe and secure with no loss to his property, then on considering this he would be glad and full of joy. So that illustrates the overcoming of doubt. And so then the text says, so too when these five hindrances are not abandoned in oneself or in himself, the monk sees them respectively as a debt, a disease, a prison, slavery, and a road going across a desert. But when these five hindrances have been abandoned, then he sees this as freedom from doubt, uh, freedom from debt, as good health, release from prison, freedom from slavery, and a land of safety. Wow. <laughs> That takes us to the end of the text. <laughs> and it's 4.01, so we have some time. Maybe we could even have 20 minutes if, for questions. So please feel welcome to ask questions now, not only on the last section, but it can be on anything covered in the course. Not anything. <laughs> <laughs> But anything covered in the course of this retreat from Friday, we started Friday evening, right? Mm -hmm. Through this afternoon. Okay. Albert? Okay. Albert, then I don't know your name. Christine. Christine. Albert? Uh, sorry to ask you to repeat yourself, but uh, the hindrance of doubt is, uh, you said it's not doubt with regard to things like uh, the teaching on dependent origination, but it, it, what is it? I said in this context, yeah. as one of the five hindrances, because the, the five hindrances are discussed in the process of leading up to the development of samadhi, rather than the cultivation of wisdom. So I take it to be doubt the sort of questions and uncertainty regarding the procedures for the development of concentration. Like how does one attend to the object? What happens when this obstacle arises? What happens when that obstacle arises? Do I focus my attention? I mean even <laughs> with regard to say, something like mindfulness of breathing, people have a lot of doubts because the tradition says <laughs> focus the attention around the nostrils or the upper lip and then some teachers say you know you don't have to focus here but you could focus on the abdomen or the chest wherever you experience the breath and so you know there can't be questions about what does one do how does one do it 
some say for loving kindness, for kids with individual person. Airplanes. <laughs> that noisy vehicle suddenly reminded me I haven't heard airplanes this afternoon. <laughs> there have been a few. Excuse me? There have been a few here. Maybe I was. <laughs> have you been on the call? Maybe my attention was really absorbed <laughs> in explaining oh, no, the. It's, it's Sunday. The day I was you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Actually, I lodged a complaint with the Port Authority. <laughs> did you really? I did. Listen, thank you, Monty. <laughs> I don't know if that's what caused this grief. Or... Yes, yeah, so I was saying with loving kindness meditation, like the way I, I learned it, you know, from the text, like the Visuddhi Mugga, is to, and from other, from teachers, to work first with individual persons and then to expand. But I know some people say, ah, we don't have to do it like that. In the suttas, it just speaks about sending loving kindness to the six directions, so just do it in that way. So we can have doubts about how does one proceed. Okay then, Christy. Yeah, um, so my question is about something you said in your very first talk on Friday about the word anger, because you said that the word anger in Pali, the way it's translated into, it's translated as anger in English that you didn't see it as an exact uh, translation, that in English, like, anger can cover a, a range of, uh, you know, from irritation to full-on rage. And I was wondering if you had, if you could, like, talk about that a bit more and what your reasoning is for, for not seeing them as completely... Yeah, wrong. what I said is that, okay, in the Pali word used is koda, the Sanskrit krodha. And this is what we translate and quite accurately and normally and correctly as anger. Um, and koda is always considered an unwholesome quality, an undesirable quality. And so it's something that one has to overcome with mental training. And the opposite of anger is patience, so one has to be able to endure abuse from others and aggression from others, endure it patiently without retaliating. And then one has to, towards the persons towards whom one feels anger, one should develop loving kindness. But then I said that, like in our everyday life, say in contemporary society, we face sometimes oppressive or afflictive social conditions. And so we think, we raise the question like, what is the appropriate response to that? And it seems to me that one could use, and I would use this with some reservation, the expression righteous anger or righteous indignation. But I explained that it means that the way I would understand it, that one doesn't, that anger normally means that one loses control of one's mind, that some, this mental force takes over one's mind so that one will speak aggressively, act aggressively, and even like stand up to injustice, but with denigrating those who are oppressive and denouncing them and speaking, yelling at them and even cursing them. If that is righteous indignation, then I put that in ordinary anger that has to be overcome. But just this whole, a second. But I use the expression moral indignation or moral outrage where the mind is patient, calm, clear, balanced, but it means one is willing like to stand up and resist and oppose those who are acting in ways that are considered that one considers unjust, oppressive, um, destructive, harmful and so forth. Um, you said that in the state of anger, the mind is clear and composed. In the state of what? In, in the state of anger you're describing, this indignation, the mind is yeah, clear and composed. Yeah. So I take it to mean that anger here is not corrosive. Um, I've heard elsewhere the description of the, even if one isn't angry, one might be fierce. Like I yeah. heard this story of Adam Smeder, who fiercely 
grandma, uh, denounced a monk who had disrobed without permission and said, said sharp things to him. Mm-hmm. But quite inside inside him, he wasn't <coughs> in anger. Two stories right. of teachers denouncing monks, meanwhile, their feet are completely lax, and they're, they're bodily, they're entirely relaxed. Yeah. Is this is that the same thing that you're speaking of, or is it different yeah. than fierceness? Well, I'm, I was speaking about moral indignation or moral or righteous anger in the case of standing up against oppressive and harmful maybe social and political policies and, and actions. But this could be like another example. In fact, like, yeah, it's actually a good example. Like sometimes teachers will speak strongly to their pupils, criticize them, and fiercely, like, um, I think the famous Thai forest master Achan Mun was quite well known for that. When he saw that monks misbehaving and not practicing diligently, he would call them up and give them a real, what we call a tongue lashing. But it, he was reputed to be an arhat, so his mind would not have had any <coughs> anger, but he would behaving, be behaving speaking in some in fierce ways. And even the Buddha himself like calls up sometimes disciples who are misbehaving and speaks to them sternly, but there wouldn't be anger in his mind. So is that an instance of this moral indignation? As well, I'm using, that as more, I wouldn't call that moral indignation of it, I would call that, I'd have to think of an expression for it, but it is, a stir, I would say it's giving a stern teaching or a stern reproach to misbehaving disciples. Okay. And did I get your name? No, Michael. Michael. Okay. Um, in the five aggregates, uh, I'm having difficulty um, understanding the difference between perceptions and consciousness. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we just had, I think, a discussion of that during the lunch period. No, sorry. <laughs> no, no not, not with the group. Um, okay, so this is the way, <clears throat> first the way I understand the distinction based on explanations in the text. That sanya, uh, let's do it first etymologically. Yeah, both sanya and vijnana are based on the root nya, which means to know, and on the verb janati, to know. So the verb for perception is sanjanati, and the verb corresponding to vijnana is vijanati. I don't describe too much significance to the prefix sun here, which normally has a sense of bringing together. But just the way it's explained in the text, sanya, perception, would be that which, that mental function, which picks up on, or um, focuses in on, the distinctive characteristics or qualities of the object. And the way I understand vinyana in this context, it is the, I, I explain it as the light of awareness that arises based on each of the six sense bases and illuminates the particular objective domain corresponding to that sense base. And we find in the suttas which explain the five aggregates that perception is differentiated according to the object. 
So there is perception of visible forms, perception of sounds, perception of odors, perception of taste, perception of, of textures, perception of mental objects. And then in contrast, vinyana is differentiated according to the sense base from which it arises. So eye consciousness, ear consciousness, simile nose, tongue, body, mind consciousness. So if you hear a bird outside, yeah. and you, you know, just that um, ear consciousness receiving those sound waves, that's consciousness, but then mm -hmm. identifying it as a seagull, that's perception. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But we all, always have to remember that perception and consciousness, the sanya and vinyana, are sort of always <coughs> intertwined. Right. You know, so there's a sutta which says, speaks about, I think, vedana, sanya, vedana, and vinyana. Feeling, perception, and consciousness. It says that these three are closely associated and it's very difficult to distinguish one from the other. Okay. Um, on that note, how do you feel about the translation of sanya as recognition rather than perception? I think that's too limited. Too limited. Yeah, because um, there can be like in a, an initial encounter, there isn't recognition, but it's on the first encounter, one picks up, you know, the quality of the object, and then on a later occasion. Then it will be sanya, which is which is uh, responsible for the recognition. But on the first encounter, there isn't recognition, but a first acquaintance. So I meet somebody for the first time, then I can't say that I recognize that person, but I'm perceiving, say, the face, the way of moving of that person. So then when I see that person on a later occasion, if I pass them on the street, then through Sanya, then I recognize them. Um, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Is yeah. that? So the three things that are interrelated, so would that be first contact? Then you said there's feeling in one of those. I said I think feeling, perception, perception. and consciousness. consciousness. So, but at first there's a contact. So you see like whatever, like there's an object, then there's a contact with the yeah. object. Yeah. And then there's feeling. What is the order of this? Actually, strictly, there isn't an order since they all arise simultaneously on any occasion of experience. They're all present, though in the flow of cognition, one or another can become more prominent and can condition one of the others. For example, okay, say I hear a knocking on the door, then I open the door, then I see it's a friend that I haven't seen for a long time, and he's come to visit me. So first takes place, so there takes place the perception and the recognition was at, like, this is my friend. And so at the moment that the perception takes place, there is a feeling there. But now that feeling, at the very moment of perception, it would be subordinate to the perception. But now the recognition takes place, and then on the next occasion, then a joyful feeling arises. And so there's still a perception there, but now the joyful or pleasant feeling has arisen and become more prominent. And the consciousness is in and the consciousness, background of allowing everything. Yeah, consciousness is sort of there in the background, illuminating the whole thing. Okay. And then conversely, okay, that's where perception is more prominent first, then the perception is more prominent first, and then the feeling becomes more prominent later. Um, let me just think of an example where the feeling might come first and then the perception later. 
somebody gives me a beverage and maybe I've had this beverage before but not in a long time, like a kind of maybe a juice from some South Asian fruit that grows in Sri Lanka, let's say custard apple, which we don't see often in the U.S. So it gives me a custard apple juice, so I drink it, and first I get a pleasant feeling when drinking it, and then comes the perception, ah, this is custard apple juice. So the, the feeling here is more prominent first. Yeah, of course there's the perception of the taste, but the pleasant feeling is prominent. Then the recognition, or the perception, custard apple juice. Isn't there a different kinds of perception? At first there is this, there is, you know that you're drinking something, there's a there's, perception. There's a perception of you drinking something, there's a liquid that you're drinking, yeah. and then there's a categorization of what it actually is yeah, yeah. called. So yeah, it's like yeah. a different level. There yeah, are many, many kinds of levels and different levels of degrees of complexity and perception. Okay, Wendy? Yeah. Um, and I have to ask, keep the question <laughs> concise. Yeah, yeah. So this is about uh, the whole yeah. Um, I, I always thought, but now I realize it's not true. It's like if you can develop infinite compassion or unconditional love, right? Yeah. Then you don't need necessary wisdom and knowledge to reach your mind. It seems like you actually need both. Yeah, you certainly need wisdom to reach your life. So why is like compassion? Um, unconditional love, like with like the virtual innocence. Wait, what? With like the virtual innocence is not. not Wait, they're gonna cost it. Planes, planes, planes of stuff, but the cost. Sounds fun. It's like, it's like, why it's like, it's like if you cultivate infinite compassion, that's yeah. not enough to attain life. Like, yeah. Why is the wisdom piece necessary? Yeah, because enlightenment means seeing and understanding things as they really are. Okay. And that is, call it the blossoming, the, fluoresce, the flourishing, the um, fulfillment of wisdom. Yeah, compassion itself is an, an outstanding virtue, an essential virtue. But just on its own, compassion, I mean, it temp tentatively purifies the mind, but that latent tendency of ignorance, that is sort of the most fundamental ground of all of the defilements. And to eliminate ignorance, one needs its exact opposite. And the exact opposite, the antidote to ignorance, is wisdom or insight. I would think that as wisdom develops, compassion will sort of naturally emerge and grow along with the wisdom. So it's not the other way around, like if you develop your compassion, the wisdom like also comes? Maybe there'll be a strong disposition towards wisdom if one develops compassion, but still one has to make the deliberate effort to cultivate wisdom. It doesn't come. It doesn't come. Okay. Just, um, there'll, okay. there'll be the disposition to wisdom, but for the wisdom to actually arise and function effectively, it has to be systematically and thoroughly cultivated. Okay, maybe we could take one more question. Okay. I see two hands. So Christopher, and then there was that hand in the back. Margaret. Margaret. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but they, um, you've mentioned Sri Lanka and South Asia quite a bit, and um, in, in those countries you see the role of, you see Buddhism as a spiritual practice, and yep. as a practice of faith. Yep. Um, and I'm wondering how you see the roles of faith and spirituality yep. in Buddhism. Yeah, I actually think this is a very important aspect, and it's an aspect which I think maybe at this stage, sort of not 
emphasize so much in Western Buddhism. Um, like in the traditional like way of practice, say in Asia, the idea is that one has faith as the foundation and inspiration. Then on that basis, one takes up the precepts, sila, and then if one wants to go, often people just remain sort of content with having faith and observing precepts. Then on the basis of faith, they engage in a lot of devotional practices. Like what's very widespread in Sri Lanka, maybe you saw it when you were there, is the, what they call the Bodhi Puja. Yeah. That's the worship around the Bodhi tree. It's not the worship of the Bodhi tree, but it's the worship of the Buddha Dharma Sangha around. It takes place usually at night, very beautifully, under the under the Bodhi tree. And each temple will have its own Bodhi tree. Um, and so there'll be faith, and then the observance of precepts and devotional practices. And those devotional practices could actually be seen as ways of disposing the mind mm -hmm. towards calmness and towards concentration. But then from there then one will go on to you know to practice meditation and then to develop insight. Now what's happened in the West, maybe say starting the nineteen twenties, there came like people became, this, who were interested in Buddhism, sort of grasped upon the wisdom teachings of Buddhism. <laughs> and then, maybe starting in the 1960s, people thought, well, it's not enough just to study and discuss the doctrinal teachings, but we really have to put it into practice through meditation. <laughs> and then comes the mindfulness mushrooming of the mindfulness practices. <laughs> but then, at least some people start to wonder, well, something is missing from our practice. What is missing? And then it's sila, observance of precepts. And also, what goes along with the faith aspect is dana, generosity, particularly the support of the monastics. Yeah, so then some will think, okay, we have to observe but maybe through the meditation practice then they see that there's something that's here, not just something you could conveniently take for your own personal ends, but that this practice comes out of a rich tradition. So then they start looking into the traditional teaching and then faith and the observance of precepts and practice of generosity will arise. And mother. Would it be incorrect to think of self as phenomena? To see the self as... To think of self as a phenomenon? I'm not quite sure that I understand. Well, so like I'm thinking of framing. So I understand for conventional reality, we don't, like we use the word I. Yeah. Say like, yeah. I think I am hungry instead of this body is hungry, for yeah. example. Yeah. But when you're thinking about the five aggregates in total, would it be incorrect to say that this phenomenon like the phenomena of self. Yeah, I think what one could say is that, or what I would say, that the idea of self can be used as a conventional notion to designate what we would call the empirical person. So in reference to ourselves, we could speak about myself, yourself, and use the word self in that way. And in fact, the Buddhist text what, I, what I've noticed, when the Buddha or the text is speaking in an ethical context, they have no hesitancy about using the word self. So they'll sit, the text will say, by yourself evil is done, by yourself good is done, you yourself must make the effort, you yourself must purify yourself. So they make very, very free use of the word self when speaking in an ethical context. So it's really what the teaching of non-self is directed against is the notion of what one might call a metaphysical self, like some substantial entity at the core of one's being. Is there another framing you would use besides the word self to substitute? For the metaphysical self, um, 
I know I'm just used to using the word self. <laughs> but I always have to, you know, to make it clear to people, sort of qualify it and say what's meant is some substantial core of personal identity or some permanent and lasting core of identity. Otherwise people think, ah, previously I had a self, now I don't have a self. <laughs> yeah, so the Buddha also rejects actually the, the idea that there is no self. Because that is what leads to confusion. So he says that when he's teaching the non-self, what he says is that this is not self, that is not self. Which doesn't mean that behind this that there is a self, but non-self is always taught in a practical way to negate the identification with something as being myself. What is the what? The, the Buddha nature, that's the permanent self that they're Yeah, actually, the concept Buddha nature and Buddha self, those are terms that come from a, a different Buddhist tradition from that with which I'm acquainted. Yeah. It doesn't, those ideas don't come from the Pali Nikayas, yeah, it, but it comes from a rather late stage in. Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, so it's now 4.30, so we should come to the end of the retreat with the final meditation session. But maybe since we've been sitting for a long time, it could be good to stand up and do a little, a few minutes of stretching and unwinding exercises.